Hello and welcome to this webinar by me, David Balding, uh, and it's part of a series that I've made in conjunction with my colleague Michael Anderson in Denmark. Now, this is talk five in a series of webinars. It's mainly about the forensic evaluation of Y-profile evidence, but actually today we're going to be focusing on implications for our method that we've developed for Y-profile evidence, its implications for mitochondrial DNA profile evidence. So to make sense of this talk, we recommend that you are already familiar with talk one in this series, which describes our new method, and that's based on presenting to the court an estimate of the number of males with matching Y profile. Uh, and so we're gonna look at the implications of this idea for, for mtDNA, uh, as I've said. Uh, unlike for the Y profile, we're not going to present a fully developed proposal for reporting mtDNA evidence in court, and I'll explain a little why not. Uh, but we do address a really central question. Once you've seen an mtDNA sequence, how many others are expected to have the same sequence? So a little about the mitochondrial genome. Uh, important thing is that it's passed from mother to offspring, male and female offspring. Uh, the other important thing is that unlike the rest of your DNA, which is within the nucleus of a cell, and there's just one or two copies of each chromosome, the mitochondrial DNA uh, resides in the mitochondria, which are outside the cell nucleus in many copies. It's a small circular genome of 16,000 nucleotides, roughly. Uh, and because of the many copies, it's particularly useful for recovering DNA from very small or degraded samples of many copies, give you a better chance of being able to, to recover a profile, uh, but also some human tissue, uh, for example, nails, bone and hair, they have mitochondrial DNA, but, but little or no nuclear DNA. <coughs> And of course, given the inheritance, uh, the mitochondrial DNA is useful for investigating female line relatedness. I'll just give an example of that in a moment. Uh, but mainly I'm talking about uh, identification of, uh, of individuals from the mtDNA sequence. And key to this is the mutation rate of the mitogenome. Uh, first of all, we just notice that uh, in the past, just certain regions of the genome were sequenced in order to conserve resources and because sequencing was difficult and expensive. Nowadays, it's pretty straightforward to sequence the whole mitogenome, not quite all because parts of it are difficult to sequence and aren't always uh, sequenced. And because of that small, uh, difficult to sequence part of the genome, it's actually hard to get a good estimate of the mutation rate of the whole mitochondrial genome and it also might not be relevant to forensic practice if it doesn't sequence the entire genome. So there's a little bit of roughness about the, um, about the mutation rate. Um, we, but roughly speaking, uh, there's um, about a one and a half percent probability that a child will have a different um, mtDNA sequence from its mother. So that's about one in every 70 generations. And that's about an order of magnitude lower than for the latest generation of Y chromosome profiles, which have mutation rates up towards 15%. <clears throat> so this mutation rate is on the one hand very high compared to the rest of the genome, uh, but it's too low for the MTD on, on mtDNA on its own to be highly discriminating. And uh, just a little example of this, um, I was involved in the analysis of the famous bones under the car park in Leicester, UK, which were eventually confirmed to have come from English King Richard III. And he lived over 500 years ago, roughly 20 generations. Um, so because of that number of generations, the autosomal DNA was of very little value because it halves every generation. So over 20 generations, even if you were a direct descendant of Richard III, uh, you would be unlikely to share any autosomal DNA with him. Uh, now, of course, nobody shares Richard III's mtDNA directly because it's maternally inherited, uh, but uh, the researchers did find two individuals alive today that were descendants of Richard III's sister, and they both nearly matched. One of them was a perfect match. Uh, 
so this is quite striking evidence that a person found today who was related to Richard III through 20 generations or more had exactly the same mtDNA sequence as the bones. However, the evidence is not quite as decisive as I think the many people were led to believe. And in my analysis, I came up with a likelihood ratio of just under 500 for this, uh, for this evidence, which is strong, but it's only a relatively small part of the overall likelihood ratio of, of nearly 7 million for all the evidence. Uh, so the mtDNA evidence played a part, but it wasn't uh, convincing on its own. <laughs> the reason is that because mutations are occurring every 70 generations, uh, it means that there can be hundreds and maybe even thousands of individuals with the same M M mitochondrial DNA sequence as a given observed sequence. Um, <clears throat> that can be... Um, the reason for that is that if you go back through your mother's 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 and so on, even tens of generations, uh, then that maternal line ancestor is likely to have the same mtDNA sequence as you, and then all maternal line descendants of that ancestor are also quite likely to have the same mtDNA sequence as you, and that can be many individuals, as I say, hundreds or maybe thousands. So a consequence of that is we're going far enough back in time, the details of population growth and migration and other characteristics like that become important. And that, that's the kind of key reason why it becomes difficult to present this in court, but I'll come back to that later. Um, but we considered three population models, uh, one with the growth of in the population size of 2% per generation, up to a current size of 1.2 million, and two constant size populations of sizes 300,000 and 1.2 million. Uh, of course, there are many other population models you could consider, uh, but this was at least uh, useful to investigate the effects of population model on the answers that we're interested in. Um, <clears throat> for our purposes, we took the size of the population to be the last three generations. So we roughly speaking think of three generations as being alive or at least potential sources of a particular uh, DNA sample. Now, I mentioned that the um, that the mutation rate was, was difficult to get accurately. We looked at two published uh, sources on mutation rates, uh, mtDNA mutation rates, but they focused on individual regions rather than the whole genome mutation rate. And um, because the data are still you know, a little bit hard to get, the, 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 the estimates are a little bit different. So for some of the analysis, we considered both of these mutation models separately. And I'll give you the references for those on the final slide. <coughs> So the first thing to do is a comparison with real databases. But even before we look at that, I want to just make this point that we didn't expect a close match and, uh, and close agreement really would be hard to interpret anyway. And then there's a similar problem with Y profile databases, but it's the same idea here that real databases are subject to sampling biases. They're not random samples from populations. And what really matters here is the inclusion of relatives, uh, remote relatives in the database. And, and the, the way that the database is assembled can have a big impact on the representation of relatedness. For example, if there's oversampling in a particular uh, region or some other section of the population, um, if there's a policy of excluding known relatives or including known relatives, that can have an impact. And it's that level of relatedness uh, that is key. And that, that's, that's why there are these sampling biases become um, important. But in any case, it's useful to have a look and see if we're in the same ballpark as the same as the as published databases, real databases, for a key characteristic, which in our case, we just focused here on the, the number of singleton sequences. So those that are only occur once in the database. So we found two published databases, one from the USA and one from Iran. Uh, and I printed the numbers here. Nearly all the sequences were singletons. Uh, 259 out of 360, 263 for the USA database and 315 out of 352 uh, for the Iranian database. Again, there's, there's quite the sampling is matters here in Iran. It was from uh, particular ethnicity, some of them somewhat isolated and remote, and that's why there's a fewer singletons there. But looking at our results here for six models, that's our three population models and our two mutation models, um, these black lines here and here indicate the database values for a number of singletons, and these um, box and whisker plots uh, 
uh, indicate the range of values for that quantity in random databases sampled uh, from these simulated populations. So you can see that our different models are broadly in the right ballpark for one or other of these two databases. As I said, we, we, didn't, uh, we didn't expect uh, a close agreement, um, but this at least encouraged us that our models are, are not completely unrealistic. <laughs> so here is the first answers to the important question of once you see an mtDNA sequence, how many other individuals in the population here our simulation uh, simulated populations are just for one mutation model in this case um, and you can see that the you know the first uh, thing to notice is that the number of matches is typically a few hundreds so we looked at key percentiles of the distribution of the number of matches this is the 50 percentile or median you can see it's about 300 uh, for the growth population and about 150 for the two constant populations. And then there's the 95% point and the 99% point. Uh, so these are the upper tail of the distributions. And these are the kind of um, best case scenarios, typically from a defenseless point of view, that there are more other individuals out there that, that are likely to have the, uh, the, the same mtDNA sequence. And obviously in the forensic situation, we've got to think seriously about scenarios that are favorable to the defense. So you typically want to look at the 95 or 99 percentile. Um, looking a bit closer, we see that whereas um, growth has a big impact on the answers, uh, but population size doesn't. Uh, so that's a really key result. And the impact of growth is much bigger out in the tail of the distribution than for the median. It's just a factor of two to one here, but it's more than five to one for the 99 percentile. Um, so these are all important uh, general observations. But one key kind of take home message that is uh, true for these simulations, and we think more generally that the number of matching individuals for an mtDNA sequence that you might have observed is typically in the order of a few hundred, uh, but it could be in the order of thousands. <clears throat> so one interesting question is, these other matching individuals, how closely related are they to the focal individual, let's say yourself, for example. So you think of your own mtDNA sequence. Uh, I've said there are hundreds and possibly thousands of people out there in the population that will have the same sequence as you. As you. How closely related are they to you? And that's what this plot shows. Now, on this axis, the x-axis is the number of generations or meioses in biology speak here. And you see it's going up to 500 or 1,000. So you think, well, that, you know, that's huge in, in relatedness. That's way, way beyond the relatives that I know about. And that's true. Um, but the, uh, the, the level of relatedness is um, in, under our simulation models is indicated up here. So you can see that you're getting up to probability one at about 250 generations and getting very close to one at 500 generations. So that means that the matching individuals are typically less than 250 generations away from you uh, and almost always less than 500 generations. Now, as I was just saying, that seems like a lot, but these dotted lines down here correspond to random pairs of individuals in the populations. And you can see that 500 generations, uh, to be related within 500 generations is very unusual for random pairs. So although these matching individuals are quite distant from you in terms of how you normally think about your relatives, which as I've noted here is usually at most up to about 10 generations and we're going well beyond that. Uh, but they're much, much closer than random pairs of individuals in the population. So the implications of that are a little bit subtle. I mean, 250 generations is a lot. It means you can go back, you know, 100 or more generations in the past uh, to a common ancestor and then down that number of generations to a matching individual alive today. And in those hundreds of generations, they could have migrated anywhere in the world but there will still be some tendency for them to live in the same area as you and have some similar characteristics to you. Um, and, uh, and they'll be typically, you know, very different uh, properties than kind of random pairs of individuals. Uh, so it does mean that matches can be spread around the world, uh, but nevertheless, it's true that most of the, you know, there'll be a, an increased frequency of matching individuals coming from the same region as you typically. And that affects the, um, the the sampling properties of databases and their rel and their relevance. Uh, 
So that's all quite an interesting thing. We've, we've considered again all our six models here, the two mutation rate models and the three population models. Now I'm just going to put this away to focus on uh, the, um, the plots here because what if we have a database frequency for the mtDNA profile? And I've shown here results for three uh, database sizes of 100 at the top, 1,000 in the middle, and 10,000 at the bottom. Our databases are actually drawn randomly from our simulated population. So again, it's important to note that real databases are not random samples, and that will have an implication for the interpretation, how important that is. Uh, we don't know, it might not be too important, but nevertheless, we've got to keep that in account. So what's going on here? The black <coughs> lines are the solid and dashed for our two mutation models. So uh, we don't worry too much about that for the moment. The black lines are the same in every case because they represent the number of matching individuals, the distribution of the number of, of matching individuals. And let me say again, the cumulative distribution of matching individuals, so up to 2,000, 4,000 here. Uh, on the x-axis, um, but that's without any database information. And then the colored curves are for our two mutation models uh, with um, uh, for different observations of the frequency in the database. So this color here at the top uh, corresponds to zero count in the database, uh, then one, then two, then five, and in this bottom plot, we also consider 10 matches in the database for the biggest um, database. <clears throat> so one thing to notice is that um, an observation of zero in the database or one in the database doesn't change things too much from our no database situation. And that's because we already know from our mutation model that any particular sequence is going to be rare. So an observation of zero or one is not too unexpected. Um, but higher counts can be informative and they push the distribution off to the right, you know, in other words, to higher numbers of matching individuals. Uh, naturally enough, a zero count pushes the distribution from the black curves in the other direction towards fewer matches. So to read this here, it's a cumulative probability. So if, for example, we focus on this vertical line here, that corresponds to a thousand matching individuals. Um, so if you observe zero count in the database or you have no database information, you're pretty likely probability about three quarters or 80% uh, to have fewer than a thousand matching individuals. Uh, if you observe one count in the database here, this is, I'm looking at the database of size 100, one count or two, then the number of matching individuals is pushed, pushed up with high probability above a thousand uh, and so on as you go down the page. <coughs> for when you have the bigger database, of course, the curves rise more steeply because you have sharper information from that bigger database size. So I've come to the end of my main points here. So re let's re recap the, the, the major points that we've been making. So first of all, I mentioned that it's difficult to use the results represented here in court reporting uh, because uh, the population model does matter here more than for in the high mutation rate Y profiles that I was talking about in our, in our other webinars. Uh, and we've only investigated here a small range of population models. But nevertheless, uh, oh, sorry, let me just point out that there's, yes, there's no population structure in our models. We haven't looked at migration. So there's many other things to take into account. But the key point that we've observed, and I think that's likely to be pretty robust, is that for any observed mitochondrial DNA sequence, there's typically gonna be at least hundreds of individuals uh, with the same sequence, <coughs> um, and there could well be thousands. Those matching individuals are all matrilineal relatives. In all of this talk, when, I, when I've said relative, I mean maternal line relative only. That's all we're considering here. Um, now, they're all going to be related. The relatedness can be quite distant, uh, but still, they're much closer than random pairs of individuals in the population, so that has implications for the value of the evidence. We've also emphasized that database frequencies can be sensitive to sampling biases. It's all about the extent to which relatives are included in the database. And if there's any kind of you know, clustering of individuals that are included in the database, then that could lead to relatives being overrepresented uh, and, 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 the, and the database has been somewhat misleading. Um, but I've also made the point that 
even if the databases are reliable, if they're good, close to being random samples from the population, they're still not as informative as you might have expected. Um, <clears throat> so a frequency of zero in a database of size 10,000, you might think, wow, that's really rare. And, and it is informative, um, but that's still consistent with under our 1.2 million constant population model, a median of 54 matches in that population and a 95% percentile of well over 200 matches. Um, so I think that would be quite a different impact on a jury of telling them, oh, we didn't see this profile at all in a sample of size 10,000. Uh, a juror might think, well, it probably doesn't exist. But if you tell them, well, we expect there's going to be uh, about 54 people matching in the population uh, and possibly even a few hundred, uh, I think that, and then, you know, we've got to be sure from a jury's point of view of that this is the right individual rather than one of those other matching individuals, then I think the impact of that evidence will be quite different. So, of course, that 55 and 233 are never going to be precise in terms of a real population, but you, they give you the broad kind of ballpark idea of how many matches are out there in the population. So I hope you found this talk uh, interesting. Almost everything I've said here is in our published paper. So don't worry if you've missed anything here, you can find all the details in this paper here. Uh, there's the details for our, the, the references for our two mutation models that we used. Uh, and here's a list of the other talks in this series. And thanks for coming along.